being recorded on video makes me a little bit more gun shy, so the so, price doesn't crack the lens. So he's not going to say anything important. And I won't sing or dance, Marsha. Okay. Just uh, in, just introduce yourself. So I'm, I'm David Dahl, the former advisor of Merced County. Uh, we're part of the Cooperative Extension uh, group of the University of California, and many of you probably have met me in the past, but if not, uh, give me a ring. We're here to assist you in helping you understand, figure out problems on the farm, help with technology transfer, as well as conduct a little bit on farm research to share those results. So uh, we're just over Merced, and as I always tell everybody over here who says, well, I don't want to call you, you know, it's a drive, don't worry about it, I need to get over to the, I, I enjoy coming over and I learn a lot from over to the west side. So don't ever hesitate, um, we're here to help. The same thing with Jalindra, when he will come on a little bit. So I thought we would start off as we do in most fall meetings, talk a little bit about the post-harvest component of almond production, and then probably wrap up a little bit into how to manage these orchards going into the winter time more from an agronomic perspective. Um, as many, some of you may know, my background's actually in diseases, so if I say something that seems a bit off in soil science, just throw something at me and, and uh, we'll get it fixed. Um, but let's start off with nitrogen management. I think it's always important to kind of think, keep about this, uh, as we pull off this crop and we redevelop these trees for the coming year, it's important to make sure the trees are, in some cases, put to bed well, as we like to say. Um, research that has been done down in Kern County, which granted means we have a, our earlier harvest timing than where we are up here, has shown that for the most point, we can't actually pull our, the trees cannot pull up more than about 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So if we had a, a, a very serious crop load and we're trying to put nitrogen back on because we're afraid of a little bit of deficiency, Applying more than 50 pounds of, of nitrogen per acre may be a bit wasteful because the trees won't necessarily be able to pick that material up. And the reason why is that that nitrogen is actually hooked up with the water system in the transpirational stream. So it gets dissolved in soil water, it gets picked up, and moves to the growing points of the plant uh, through the, this island for the most part. So as the days begin to shorten, as we all have known, it's getting around seven, and uh, as the heat begins to decrease, although not this week, um, the, the transpirational rate will, will begin to drop and we're able, we're actually not able to uphold, or get as much nitrogen back up into the tree. So then you have uh, the nitrogen residing in the soil and although the previous years we've had drought, that's not as much of a concern of leaching, but if we do have a heavy rain year, we can actually be losing that nitrogen below the root zone. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind as we uh, go into that post-harvest season. And why I brought that up first is because most, most of us have heard that for about every thousand fertile pounds that we pull off the field, it's about 80, we need to apply about 80 to 85 pounds of nitrogen. And that includes the inefficiency factor of nitrogen application. Actual elemental nitrogen is around 65 pounds, but we are only between 70 to 80 percent efficient with our nitrogen. So we pumped it up to 85 to replace what we have removed. So if we come into um, June and we realize with our, our, mid -Ju our July, with our mid-July leaf sample that we're, we're running into a bit of deficiency, and that's under that 2.2 level, uh, we'll come in and try to bump that up a little bit to get those trees back to efficiency level in, in the fall. So again, calculate how much you've applied and how much you need to put on, and, and ideally, 20% in the post-harvest period, not to exceed 50 pounds. Um, so what that means is if we have a 3,000 pound crop, we need about 240, I wish they had a 3,000 pound crop probably, but we, we need about 240 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, we would shoot to probably put around 40 to 45 pounds of that on in the post-harvest period, and the remainder, 80%, should have been applied uh, prior from mid to late March to the beginning of June. Okay, so the second component is potassium. Uh, we talked a little bit about nitrogen removal, um, but almonds are potassium hogs. Uh, they'll remove about 76 pounds of potassium for every thousand kernel pounds. We convert that to potassium oxide. It actually is about 96 pounds of potassium oxide. So when we run that calculation, for every thousand kernel pounds we remove, we need about 200 pounds of potash to, to replace that, um, or potassium equivalent. And that material, for especially using potash, would probably, it's, it's a good time to put some of that on in the dormant period. Um, one thing about potash, and especially in the soil type, is it tends to bind very tightly to clays or to, to the vermiculite within the soil. 
So it takes a little bit to rebuild stores if you run into a little bit of depletion uh, because it takes a while to release off those exchange sites on the, on the soil particle. So we flip that back around, we say, okay, we had a 3,000 pound crop. We need to put on 290 pounds of K2O, which is roughly 560 pounds of potash. Some of you guys will sit there and say, well, well Dave, that doesn't make sense. If I'm gonna spread only 500 pounds of potash per acre, it's gonna cost me more to apply to the material. Um, and that's why some people will tend to slug it on uh, on an every other year basis. So they'll make a big application and then hold off a year and come back in and, and, and make those applications on a AB type cycle. We have seen a, a recent um, occurrence of the use of in runs uh, potassium sources, so KTS, as well as soluble grade potash. And I would probably suggest that I recommend using those products, um, mainly because I, I do believe that in season, potassium applications do help keep the tree levels up because it's in the soil water, in contrast having to be released. Um, but nonetheless, potash applications in the fall are probably the best bang for your buck in getting potash back on the field. And round, wrapping up with the other macronutrient, phosphorus, we don't tend to use a lot of phosphorus within almonds. Some of them around 7 pounds of actual elemental P, so about 8.6 pounds of, of PTO5 per 1,000 kernel pounds. So it's not a, a tremendous amount of material. We usually can get that from the greater parent material, but there are some cases where you may be seeing some phosphorus deficiency, especially as we start ramping up all these various other components in the soil, salinity, magnesium, and so on. So keep that in mind um, as you look at it and you compare back to your mid to light leaf sample. So where should we be back on that mid to light leaf sample? Hey, I should have started there, Jim, right? I mean, we have to start at the beginning. Um, many people like to run pretty rich, especially nitrogen, uh, but we have found through the University of California found through multiple trials that there's not much need to be over 2.5% if you feel comfortable with your sampling protocol. So if you're accurately representing the trees within your orchard and you're pulling back over 2.5%, you're not gonna get an added benefit from going much beyond that. I know a lot of us like to keep it a little bit higher, uh, but and the higher we go with nitrogen, the more haul run we tend to see, and the more uh, invigorated growth that can occur where we essentially get blind wood that may occur on those rapid shoots, which actually don't set much fruit to begin with as well. Um, with potassium, it's around 1.5, and I think some of us feel a little bit more comfortable stretching that about 1.8, so somewhere between 1.5 and 1.8 percent. Uh, a really good study by Roger Duncan a few years ago shows that having potassium levels above 2 percent did not increase production. Uh, and they found that essentially production peaked off uh, with, I think he surveyed around 60 orchards and looked at their yields and compared it to their leaf potassium. Once you got above about 1.5, 1.6, you didn't see that sharp increase in, in yields, per, you know, kernel pounds per acre coming back. So that's kind of the target for those two. And I should mention that deficiency for nitrogen is below two, deficiency for potassium is below 1.2. So uh, you get an idea that you're still giving yourself a little bit of buffer to be above it, that sufficiency level, or deficiency level, excuse me. Okay, so covered nutrient management. I don't have to cover pest management because you'll interest here, so that's great. Um, disease management, you know, we've been in a, a period of drought for the most point, which has been kind of nice because our disease pressure has been pretty minimal. Um, but many questions, many questions I've, I've heard come up recently is dealing with haul rot. And we had a tremendous amount of haul rot this past year, mainly due to the monsoonal moisture I think that came in and really ramped up humidity right in the onset fall split. And so what do we do with that? So one, most of the case, in most cases of the haul rod, you're not attacking this year's crop. Those bread mold that's growing in the halls will go to the processor, it'll dry down, they'll be able to get those kernels into the, into the market. Not much of an issue there. But what we tend to see is when we get a haul rod infection, we actually get a, a, a dieback of the foot. And that's movement of a toxin that's being produced by that fungus into the wood and as it gets translocated up into the limb. So you can see dieback going all the way up in severe cases to you know, 12 to 18 inches. And that, that could be a significant amount of canopy that's being lost, especially since that's your active fruiting wood within that tree. So what can we do? Should we cut it out? Well, ideally, yes, I think we should, um, but I don't think at this point it's important to make a special pass to do it. If you're running through in the winter time and you'd like to cut it out, that'd be great. Uh, but what we'll tend to see is when you see where that dieback is in, where that toxin movement has stopped, 
you'll see a viable bud begin to push out a branch. And then that branch will eventually regenerate that canopy that's there. The flip end of that, why if you can, some of it might be good, or if it's within the work plan, is that wood that's in that tree, that branch, that branch will serve as a reservoir of other wood, colon, wood, wood fungi, wood colonizing fungi. This includes Bochisperia, Eutypha, Bomopsis, which can actually lead to increased pruning wound cankers and may affect orchard longevity, but more importantly on young trees. Um, so I don't really think it's a major concern, but it is something to consider if it does work into your plan um, for pruning. Uh, for the most part, running into uh, the other diseases, we'll have to wait till bloom. Um, some people have asked a little bit about rust management this time of year. I don't think there's much gain to spray. Um, you can make the application, it may make you sleep a little bit better, but I always tell people if we keep our leaves on our trees to the middle of October to the end of October, we, man we manage rust the best we can. So I don't think putting a spray on now will help keep those leaves on much longer than that. Um, Lost my train of thought. So, um, rolling back to, uh, it came up all wrong. But we'll focus, we'll move to kind of more of the agronomic components. Uh, we talked a little bit about nitrogen management. We need to also, I think most of us know um, why we need to irrigate in the post harvest period. Um, but many cases, we want to do whatever we can to reduce the amount of stress on these trees. And there's been a lot of concern about why we tend to have weaker bloom and why our crop then says, well, as it did this year as it did the past year, um, why uh, kernel size wasn't as great as we expected. And there's been some recent research, mostly in walnuts and pistachios, that have shown a, a kind of some interesting components that all that whole component of nut sack, kernel size, uh, initial kernel expansion, is all due to the ability to have a good carbohydrate reserve going into the bloom. So until that tree gets leaves out, fully expanded leaves onto it, it's not going to be able to pull up any nitrogen. It's not going to be able to generate any carbohydrate for the far its crop that's trying to set. So all these practices we do in the post-harvest period actually carry through to the spring. And last year, uh, many of us noticed uh, our near regular bloom on these trees. Uh, we saw maybe a weak set. And some of this we think, based on some recent research, is due to carbohydrate uh, storage within the tree. So when we tend to have these warmer winters, these sunny winters, the wood is warmer and as we, I think we talked about before, but in general as, as temperatures increase, the respiration rate of the tree increases. So even though it's in dormancy, it's still actively respiring, no different than we sleep, we're still breathing. And so as temperatures increase, the respiration rate increases and the tree actually has to utilize carbohydrate in order to maintain metabolic function. So when we have these real warm winters, we actually that temperature actually depletes the amount of stored carbohydrate we have in the tree. The tree goes into bloom after receiving adequate chill, and at that point, it doesn't have as much energy to divert into cell division in the beginning of the year. So I think that's some of the reason why we've been having some weaker blooms as well as weaker or smaller kernels that come into it. And that flips back around to the haul process, so the cell division for the haul actually occurs slightly after uh, the cell division for the kernel which is why we had we tend to be in leaf out mode at that point and we're able to generate more energy to push into hull development, which helps explain, partially explain, and potentially explain why we saw lower turnouts this year than expected, as well as a lot larger hulls in some are nuts. Okay, so um, so we understand we need to try to do our best to try to reduce stress on these trees in the fall. Um, many of us out here are also battling salinity issues. And I think we talked a little bit about this last year, about trying to make sure we have, we're implementing some type of winter leaching program if we're seeing an increase in our soil salinity. So one, we need to know where we are, so make sure you're pull, pulling those soil samples to know what salt levels are within your trees. Uh, but it's very common, especially if you've been using aqueduct water or even groundwater, that you can have ECs exceeding three to four um, decimals per meter as an average, with chloride levels well above the 15 millicoats per meter. Uh, it, it can be some pretty hot stuff that we have. And the reason why is we apply this water and it has salt in it, and the root does a tremendous job of excluding salt. So it sucks up the water and leaves the salt behind, and then we reapply water over our multiple irrigation cycles in the year, and that salt continues to increase in that soil profile. In many cases, we're water limited, so we're not able to leach, and so that salt begins to accumulate. At some point, the tree can't exclude it anymore, and we get uptake and we get toxicity. 
Uh, most of the toxicity we see first in the season is chloride, and as we get later into the year, we tend to see an increase in salinity, or in salt and sodium. So you tend to see the leaf burn from chloride, and then salt and sodium will actually move in a little bit down the road. Um, you may have an orchard that actually has no salt toxicity symptoms, like this one across the road, uh, but you still may have a, a sleeping problem with the salinity issue. The major issues we tend to react to is the response of the toxicity, but in many cases there's already an osmotic effect that's occurring in that soil. So as we increase the salt, it makes the tree have to produce solutes in order to get the water to move into the roots. So we effectively, as we increase salt, we make the tree work harder for water. And it has to expend energy to get water to move into the roots. So it actually will reduce growth, will reduce tree vigor, when we have an increase in salinity problem even though we may not see uh, salt toxicity at the very beginning. So how do we manage that? So uh, one thing we can do is, you know, probably throw probably throws fix at me when I say this, is we need to actually increase our water application volume to these fields. So uh, we need to try to apply more water to try to push that salt from below the, the root system of the tree. Uh, we can do that in a couple different ways. One is we can focus on just establishing a leaching program in December, uh, but even now coming into the post-harvest period as we finish up with our almond, uh, almond harvest, we can begin to run just a little bit longer sets to try to recharge that groundwater, or recharge the soil profile, excuse me, recharge the soil profile. So when the rains do come in, if we do have any rains, we can actually um, have the benefit of that clean water coming out and moving the soil out of the system. If that's not feasible due to water allocation or water availability, um, and you're looking more to a December program, I would encourage you to start earlier than we probably ever have and had in the past, uh, mainly to try to get that profile filled within the wetting pattern down to five or six feet, and then holding off to see if there's any rain that may fall. And by having a full profile that's all, although maybe filled with well water, um, by having the rain that actually falls on top of that, it'll allow that salt to continue to be pushed downward and outward. In contrast, if we keep that soil dry, especially on double line drip systems, and we have rain that falls on the whole orchard, water likes to move from wettest to driest, it actually begins to push that salt front back into the rooting zone of the tree, which makes it harder to mitigate, and it actually will increase the salt load within the active root zone. Uh, so, when we look at this leaching program, start early, get the water on, try to get, get recharged down to five feet, hopefully we begin to get some rain that will help uh, increase the leaching potential of our, of our plant. And my guess is it'll probably take, if we're seeing ECs in three and a half to four decimeters per meter, it's probably gonna take around 12 to, about 10 to 12 inches of water. Um, 10 to 12 inches of water to actually uh, get that, the ECs down to below one and a half, which is our target uh, salinity levels within these soils. And you guys are thinking this guy is nuts. You know, an acre foot of water, um, and I know it's expensive, uh, but that's the idea of trying to recharge a little bit with whatever water we have now, so when we do get a little bit of rain, we can actually use that to help us leach. Because if you think about it, and we wait for the rain to come, we have to wait for six to eight inches of rain to fall, and then we have to wait for another 10 inches of rain to fall to leach. So we have to wait for 16, 18 inches of water, in contrast to filling the profile, we can put in the water, and then what we can actually utilize when we get six to eight inches of water will count as that leaching rain that we need. Uh, again, if you're running dry and you're getting water available through the canal that comes on board in November, December, it's important to keep in mind if you have dry soil in your wetting profile, you have to irrigate when it rains. Seems counterintuitive, but again, the whole idea, especially on double lane drip systems, is as that water goes down, it keeps pushing that salt front outward because as the rain hits, it pushes it back into the tree. So it seems a bit counterintuitive, but it's important to irrigate when it rains if you have dry soil in your field and you're managing a salinity problem. Uh, gypsum, uh, or actually I should say, some people have actually probably heard in the past the, the use of calcium. So calcium can help uh, mitigate sodium problems in multiple ways. One, it can help displace sodium on the soil particle which kicks it off into the soil water, that little bit of water between the soil particles, which then as you apply water allows it to flush. The other component that calcium does is that it, it can actually help 
make the tree feel like it's not as, as salty water as it, as it is. So it actually decreases that sodium absorption ratio, which can help decrease the toxic, the toxic effects of sodium. So you tend to, if you look in the almond production manual, we recommend an SAR of three or less. Um, and you can, if you're higher than that, you actually will apply calcium or in some cases magnesium depending on your soil to actually try to bring down that sodium absorption ratio. So uh, calcium is a tool to be used, especially if you're battling a sodium problem um, and should be applied at probably some point, you know, prior to the beginning of the leaching program have to help get that calcium into the system. If you're really dealing with chloride, which has been a major issue with the canal water, uh, the Federal Water Project this year, if you're dealing with chlorides, um, you just need water because it's a negative charge anion and it will move as you fill the profile. So uh, I think for the most part that kind of wraps up what I, I really had and I thought maybe it would be better to go to questions kind of after that and go from there. Because I know I probably forgot something. You guys do a really good job of reminding me. That's part. Yeah, that's a good question. So is there a point where you can have too much water standing in the field? And I told you when this, when I, I told you the recommendation when to start the leaching program, I forgot to say when to stop. Um, ideally, uh, you want to try to avoid having saturated soil conditions about, I mean, about mid-January. So mid-January, you get this root flush that begins to form. And just like us, those roots need to breathe oxygen. So if we actually seal that soil off with water, we prevent the movement of gas, we prevent gas exchange and we create anaerobic conditions that actually will kill those fine feeder roots. And although you don't really feel it in the spring, when you kill those fine feeder roots, you don't really notice it because the weather's cool. When it gets hot, those trees tend to struggle a little bit more because they don't have that, that network of roots to provide support for water. So ideally, I think it's best to have these leaching programs wrapped up by the first week of January, which means, especially when you're on drip, you have to start them way earlier than we have in the traditional past. Um, I've seen many guys go out and begin their leaching programs in mid-January. It's way too late. It's way too late. And at this point, I don't think any of us will ever feel comfortable counting on the rain. And any rain we get should be helping us add to the leaching of a field, not waiting on it and then eventually hindering us in the end. So try to begin early. I usually say uh, if you have that significant rain, have the profile filled by the Almond Conference and no significant rain by the Almond Conference, begin the leaching program in order to have it wrapped up by the first week of January. How does the uh, leaching program affect um, weed control and where would you put a pre-emerge herbicide before or after that? Oh, I should have I should known that. You just, <laughs> um, so, <coughs> I, well that's a good question. Um, <coughs> I would probably say you're, you're going to have weeds no matter if, it's, if it stays warm. And um, on these soils, they tend to be pretty heavy. And so you're not going to have this um, concern of washing the pre-emergent below the active area where you want to apply. But my guess is I probably want to apply that. If you're wrapping up by mid-January, you can make the application at that point, or you can make it towards the end of your leaching program. And one thing to keep in mind with pre-emergence is Depending on the product you use, they can be highly bound to organic matter. So you want to make sure you have very clean berms before you make that application so you don't get misses in your weed control program. Uh, but yeah, I think I, I would probably wrap that, make that application somewhere in January. Um, if you have a rain that comes towards the end of December, yeah, I think that's a good time as well. But a little bit later in the program would probably make a little bit more sense. Do you notice the So the question is, if we have more hull rot this year, should we spray, should we plan for a fungicide next year um, at Hull Split? So hull rot, for some reason, the past two years, and I think this is due to the weather, and I had a, um, a farmer in Merced tell me, he says, anytime we get, we're getting these drought cycles, we tend to have a lot more monsoonal moisture in the summer. And it's great because we have a dry forest and we get a lot of lightning strikes, you know, gives us what we're looking at today. Um, that was a joke. Uh, so what I probably would look at is if we come into the season and we have another year of drought and we're approaching this period of time 
uh, about two to three weeks outside of Hulse, Hulse Blitz, where we're seeing that the, the, the moisture and humidity is increasing above normal. And we're seeing the clouds behind the Sierras. I think that's how you make that decision, is taking into account um, the bigger my trees, the other practices I'm applying, and then the humidity that, you know, the environmental conditions that are being conducive for disease at that period of time. Keep, I would also keep in mind that um, there is, we have been successful in reducing, now all these practices reduce hull rot, none of them prevent, but we have been successful in reducing hull rot by applying a mild stress on these trees going into hull split. And I think many times we start too late. We see hull split and we say, oh, we gotta stress these trees in order, you know, one, to force them to split, and the other one to reduce hull split, and we call that RDI. But the whole idea is that that tree actually is already stressed as it begins to split. So if you're on a deeper soil with a, a high water holding content, you may actually need to cut that water back several weeks prior to the initiation of hull split to actually dry that, that hole down a little bit and then reduce hull rot. And, and the reason why these practices work, well, the other component is nitrogen management. We talked a little bit about 2.5% mid-July. As we keep beefing these trees up to try to maintain their higher productivity, we can actually uh, increase hull rot as well. And there's been two actually independent studies. One, we just wrapped up, but uh, one was with Patrick Brown in the Kern County uh, nitrogen work, where he showed with increasing rates of nitrogen um, from 100 pounds all the way up to 250, or up to 300 pounds, even though he figured on 250. Even at the lower levels, he still saw hull rot, and as he increased his nitrogen applications, his hull rot went up. Uh, more recently, in our water production function, which we have on the east side of um, the county in the north part of Merced, we found we're irrigating trees between 70 and 110 percent of estimated ET. And as we increased the amount of water we applied to our trees, we saw uh, actually a threefold increase from 70 percent to 110 percent of the hull rot. So, that means, one, that stress trees don't get as much hull rot, but you guys will tell me stress trees don't get as much crop. And that usually leads me to tell you guys when I can solve your hull rot problem, but you won't, you'll hate me for it, um, which kind of gives us the point of compromise of trying to manage and, and reduce the vigor of the tree as we come into uh, the hull split period. And that is a combination of a little bit of cutting back on nitrogen, um, hopefully earlier in the season, um, as well as trying to reduce that water going in. Is it going to prevent all that? No. And that's kind of where the fungicides have been coming in a little bit more importantly, is we're trying to essentially protect that nut from being infected, and so timing is very critical. And why fungicides are never, uh, I would say they're not a silver bullet, is because the infection of hull rot actually occurs right when that tissue begins to rupture. And so that means you have to spray every nut when that tissue is just beginning to rupture. And that's impossible in the field, because we know how uneven the split is. So a, a fungicide may help reduce some, and usually we find it reduces about hull rot by about 10 to 15, 20 percent, um, mainly because that's what we're capturing on those nuts. And as we see in an orchard, the wider, the, the more uneven of a split we have, the more hull rot we get, and that's just due mainly to vigor that's associated with that uneven split. As well as bloom, but we, you know, we'll throw that one out, because I can't explain it. Um, <laughs> Unless we put you asleep. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of the way I look at whole rot management. Now, the other component to keep with whole rot is, you know, we tend to focus a lot on the, the black red mold, which is the black stuff we see in the hull, um, on, especially in non -Pharrell. But don't forget that um, Fritz and Monterey tend to, I tend to get more of the brown rot, hull rot. So there's two pathogens, the rhizopus, the bread mold, and the monolinea, which actually causes brown rot of peaches in the summertime. If you're seeing this gray fuzz on the outside of your holes and you're, and you're seeing that associated with that twig dieback, it's probably not rhizopus, it's probably monolinea. And I tend to see that more on the pollinators than on non -pareil. And why I'm bringing it up is the fungicide timing on that is not a pulse split. It's way back in the first week of June. And it's the same treatment timing we use to prevent brown rot on peaches. So if you can't remember this, look in, look at the IPM guidelines for peach brown rock control, and it will it'll fall right in time with that spray, that spray timing for <coughs> monolinear hull rock control, and generally tends to be on uh, our Fritz and Monterey. The only problem with that is we can't really look at the weather to determine if we need to make that application. Um, but it's something to keep in mind if you're, if you're somehow managing that problem more so than the other. 
And I suggested that to a farmer this year because he had really bad brown rot, whole rot last year. He sprayed his Monterey and Fritz, and then you got hammered by rising puss this year and it's not prevalent. So I think it's kind of a, a hit or miss on some of these things. Long-winded answer. I'm very sorry. Is whole rot ubiquitous, or once you have it, is it more likely that you'll get it? So whole rot is whole rot ubiquitous, and once you have it, are you always going to have it? It's kind of the, the question. I would say it, yes. It's, it, it doesn't matter if you've never had it, you can have it. And um, the spores of rhizopus in monolinear are, are found throughout the entire environment. It's in the soil. It's everywhere. Uh, I was on a field this year where a farmer never had whole rot, mainly because he never irrigated his trees properly. And then once I worked with him to irrigate his trees properly, his hull rot coming out of his rear end, so you can imagine how that went. And um, uh, so it's just there. And a th anything you can do to help reduce dust going into the hull split is a good practice. I know we have to run our rigs through um, to spray, but uh, there is that concern. Anything, so don't, don't go through and till our land plane when you're in the middle of hull split. Uh, that's a good way to kick more spores up into those opening wounds. Anything like that can help reduce the risk of it. So it's more about environment yes. that year than... Yeah, it, it's trying to maintain the conditions of the host as well as the, as the environmental conditions are favorable. We do the host conditions by uh, trying to reduce vigor going into split, as well as environmental conditions of increased humidity can also increase, uh, increase risk. And rain, which we had in some cases this year, right at the onset of all split, really flared up. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, rust and uh, scab, the common recommendation is to spray five weeks after petal fall. Is that because there's something physiologically at that point going on with the tree, or is that because that's the pre-harvest interval of, of the common materials? So rust and scab, the um, recommended guidelines or spray timings have been between two and five weeks after petal fall. And so I'm going to split those up, if that's all right. Um, so scab is, the optimal timing is when we see sporulate, sporulation of the lesions. So you'll get rust lesions, and this is our, excuse me, scab lesions on, that are overwearing on the twigs. And we'll see that there will begin a, a black ring that will form on, on that lesion. And that's the spores that are actually beginning, the, the fruiting body beginning to produce spores and moving out, um, beginning the secondary or primary infection cycle in the orchard. And that happens somewhere between two and five weeks. Um, the reason why two to five weeks with scab is because we want to make sure we have the leaves covered with the fungicide so as the spore lands on it and germinates and kills the spore. And that's why that optimal timing is somewhere in that two to five weeks. It's trying to pair the, the, the release of the spores with the timing of the fungicide, the protection action of the fungicide on the leaf. Rust is a little bit more difficult. And mainly because rust tends to be a little bit more of a polycyclic summer disease. It doesn't overwinter as much on uh, wood as scab does. It actually overwinters on green tissue, so only on leaves. And if you have rust in your field now, you'll start seeing the spores go from kind of a yellow color to a rusty brown color, then to a black. And that black spore is what we call teleospore. It's actually the overwintering <coughs> structure of that, of that fungus. So that will survive on leaf material that's on the ground. And then the following spring, or in the crotches of the trees, or still in the trees, in the following spring that will spread and begin uh, the infection cycle. So again, the first spray for rust, ideally, is right around that two to five weeks when you're getting out those fully expanded leaves um, and you're trying to protect them to prevent from early infection. And the reason why early infection is better than late infection is, if you think of this as a, a general disease epidemic, and even this will go back to when we talked about native orange worm, the higher population that you have, a uh, general, excuse me, a general disease epidemic will follow something like this and hit kind of a logarithmic <coughs> cycle where the population will reproduce very rapidly as you get into the steep part of the curve. If you have a higher population, you actually shift the steep part of the curve earlier into the season. If you have a lower population, you shift it further. And a, and a, a spray fungicide does exactly that. It tries to reduce the population, which the sec in the secondary infection cycles which pushes that curve a little bit later. So the idea is you protect early. So yeah, you may have some disease, but by the end of the year, you're not losing your leaves to disease. And that's why that two to five weeks is there. You may find in human, in human years, 
Uh, if you remember back to 2010 with the El Nino, if you remember that, back that far, 2010, 2011 with those cool wet springs, we had to spray multiple times for rust, even all the way into June, because of the, the environmental conditions were so suitable for disease infection. So one spray may not do it for rust, um, you may need two, but the nice thing about rust, any pesticide works on it, so pick the cheapest one. Um, most, most do a really good job. Does that help? Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Any other questions? Okay. Wow. I thank you guys for your attention, and uh, we'll hand it over to Dylan.